Good afternoon. Once again, we come together to sit under the preaching, and we thank the Lord that we are blessed to do this, not just once, but twice on this Lord's Day. On behalf of the consistory and deacons, I extend a warm welcome to all, including all guests who may be with us. We also acknowledge that there are members of this congregation who would love to join us but are unable to do so, and we hope that the live stream may be a blessing to them as well. You are reminded that the collection in this service is for Anchor, the Anchor Association. Leading us in worship this afternoon is Brother Todd Lindy, third year student at the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary and a familiar face to many here. Brother Lindy, we welcome you here in our midst. We also pray for God's blessing over us this afternoon as you lead us in this service. May we be spiritually edified through our prayer, our praise and the preaching, and may our Lord's name be glorified in our worship. Loved, we have come into the presence of the living God. Let's rise to meet him. Let us confess together. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Lift up your hearts to the Lord to receive his greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and him who, him who was and him who him who is and him who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of kings on earth. Amen. Let's respond to his greeting with the singing of Psalm 113, stanzas 1 and 2. Apostle John tells us in his first letter that no one who denies the Son has the Father, but that whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let us also confess the Son and the whole triune God with the church of all times and places, with the 
Apostles' Creed as put to music in hymn one. come before the Lord in prayer to ask for a blessing on this worship service. Father, we have just sung a confession of faith in you, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we praise your wondrous name, for you are majestic, unfathomable. How awesome you are the great three in one, we can never comprehend you. Father, we praise you for you are the creator of this whole world, heaven and earth, from the hairs of our heads to the stars in the sky. And Lord, so great is your awesome care for this your creation. You love your creation so dearly. You uphold all things and Lord, we know that you are working all things for the good of your people, for our salvation. What a wondrous confession this can be. Not a hair can fall from our heads unless it is your will. Father, in you we place our trust, and in you we have rest. And Father, we thank you for the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth took on the form of a man who suffered in body and soul his whole life, who was crucified, dead, and buried for us, and who rose from the dead victorious, who ascended into heaven, is interceding for us, and is governing this whole world. Father, we thank you for your Son and for his wondrous work, that he has saved us from our sins, and reconciled us to you. And Father, we thank you for the sending of your Spirit who fills us with faith, with love, with hope. His work is great. He unites us together as one body. He fills us with love and delight for you. Great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you for who you are and for all that you have done for us and for our salvation. 
Bless us now as we worship you together as your church. Bless the reading and the proclamation of the teaching of your word. Let your word be powerful. Let your spirit be at work in our hearts. We pray this all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading today is in connection with Lord's Day 44, which deals with the 10th commandment. We actually have two readings from the New Testament, first from Matthew 15, and then from Romans 7 and 8. First, from Matthew 15, verses 1 through 20. Here, Jesus confronts the Pharisees about their hypocrisy. Matthew 15, starting at verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you, not, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, they will, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that... Whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. We'll also read from Paul's letter to the Romans, two parts of two familiar chapters, chapter 7 and 8. We'll start at chapter 7, verse 7, where Paul describes his struggle to keep the law. We'll read till 8, verse 11, about life in the Spirit as Christians and what the struggle looks like with the Spirit's work in us. Romans 7, starting at verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yes, if it had not been for sin, not had been, not, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet, If the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means it was sin, producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin 
and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's sing in response from Psalm 19, stanzas 3 and 4.
This afternoon, we'll be looking at the doctrine of God's Word, as summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 44, which is about the Tenth Commandment and about our struggle as Christians to keep God's law. Lord's Day 44, we'll read all three question and answers. What does the Tenth Commandment require of us? That not even the slightest thought or desire contrary to any of God's commandments should ever arise in our heart. Rather, with all our heart, we should always hate all sin and delight in all righteousness. But can those converted to God keep these commandments perfectly? No, in this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience. Nevertheless, with earnest purpose, they do begin to live, not only according to some, but to all the commandments of God. If in this life no one can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, why does God have them preached so strictly? First, so that throughout our life we may more and more become aware of our sinful nature and therefore seek more eagerly the forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Christ. Second, so that while praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop striving to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach the goal of perfection. Loved brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, as Christians, spiritual struggle is common to us all. None of us is free from sin. We still struggle every day. Is there ever an evening when we can lay down to rest and there's nothing that we must confess to God? Is this not the Christian's life? A constant battle against the temptations of the devil, against the lures of the sinful world around us, and against our own sinful nature. These three are our sworn enemies, and we must battle against them. And this battle takes place first and foremost in our own hearts. The Tenth Commandment is all about our hearts and what our heart desires. With this last commandment, God stakes his claim, the claim of his kingdom, also over our whole heart. He says, this territory is also mine. Let your heart's desire be to do my will. This commandment requires that we examine our hearts. What do we love? What do we desire and what do we delight in? And if we reflect on this question, we will quickly see that our desires often go astray. We struggle in our hearts to keep a guard on what we long for. But even when we are weak, our Savior Christ is strong. In Christ, we receive forgiveness also for the times when our hearts have wandered from God. And in Him we can strive to love God's law with our whole heart. That's our theme this afternoon. In Christ, we strive to love God's law with our whole heart. First, we'll see that we are called to have perfect desires. Secondly, we'll see that we are just beginning in obedience. And thirdly, we'll see that we are righteous and renewed in Christ. And these three points will follow the three question and answers of the Lord's Day. First then, we are called to have perfect desires. 
Consider our reading from Matthew 15. The Pharisees made sure that all of the external ceremonies, the washing of hands and other things like that, were performed exactly right. That's what they were concerned about. And they looked pretty good on the outside. But what was in their hearts? What did they love? What was their deepest longing? They wanted to look good. And they loved to make sure that everyone was following these exact rules. Rules possibly handed down from their fathers, traditions, but they were made up by men. And they did not depart from these traditions even when they contradicted God's word. Their actions were not motivated by a deep love for God and for sincerely worshiping Him. No, what does Jesus call them? Hypocrites. It was all for show. Their actions and words may have looked very nice, but on the inside, their hearts were black. Jesus quotes from Isaiah and says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And we must examine ourselves after reading a passage like that and say, could the same sometimes be said of us? God wants our hearts. He doesn't want mere lip service or mere external obedience. True obedience to the law must flow from a love and delight in following God's commands. He has no use for empty show. So we must ask ourselves, does our obedience to God's law come from a pure love of God? Or does it sometimes come from other motives? What we might look like in the eyes of men? Or selfishness? If our obedience does not flow from the heart, it is no obedience at all. But you may wonder, what does heart-motivated obedience have to do with the Tenth Commandment? Well, the commandment reads, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, this commandment is different from the nine that come before it. It's not about things that can be seen and heard. All the other commandments mention actions that people can see, things that people can hear. But this last commandment enters solely into the world of our own hearts. To covet, that means to desire something that God has not given to us. To have a wrong desire in our hearts. God here in this commandment forbids us to set our heart on that which belongs to our neighbor. He mentions our neighbor's possessions, his house, his animals, his servants, his wife, or his spouse. In other words, God forbids that our heart should seek to break the seventh commandment by committing adultery, or the eighth commandment by stealing. God's last command says, and don't let your heart burn for those things which God has forbidden to you. But the Tenth Commandment also goes beyond coveting someone's possessions or his spouse. It says, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Anything. Well, what if we desire the honor and obedience that our neighbor is due? Then we would be breaking the Fifth Commandment or his life and well-being, the sixth commandment, or his reputation, the ninth. So this final commandment encompasses the whole of God's law as a sort of basis. All obedience must flow from a heart with the right motives and desires. Beloved, the desires of our heart are closely tied to what we set our eyes on what we look at often reveals what we long for. This is especially true in Scripture. 
Think about even Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 verse 6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. The sin of Adam and Eve started with a wrong desire. And that began when they stood looking longingly on what was forbidden. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And so it matters very greatly what we set our eyes on. How then do we keep our desires pure? By keeping our eyes in the right place. If our eyes are set on what is forbidden to us, are we not already desiring that in our heart? But how do we fill ourselves with radiant light? We must set our eyes in the right place, or rather, on the right person. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. That means gazing at Jesus Christ and his glory. Are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now what does that text teach us? That we must set our eyes on Jesus Christ. When we look and see and when we behold Jesus Christ and his glory, then we will be filled with his light. We will be transformed into his image. We will be made more and more like him. What a wondrous truth this is. For this is a glorious transformation. But we might ask, but how do we behold the glory of the Lord? We can't see him on earth, for he is in heaven and we are on earth. Well, the answer is that we behold the glory of the Lord in his word. It is here that we can gaze on Jesus Christ. and This is where he reveals himself to us. So we must read the word. We must meditate on it. We must pray for the Spirit that he would illumine us with the word. That we might see the character of Jesus Christ as he reveals to us the glory of the Lord in his word. It's then that we can see and behold God's glory. The glory of who he is. His grace. His goodness. All of his works for us. And then by beholding that we can be transformed. We must pray that we might be transformed into the image of Christ. And that's how our desires are also shaped and formed after our Lord Jesus Christ and into his image. For he always loved and obeyed God from a, uh, with his whole heart and with pure desires. So there in the world of our heart, God makes his claim on everything. Our whole heart, every desire, every longing, everything that we delight in, it must all be fully devoted to God. And even as we look to Christ and are continually transformed into his image, even in that we still recognize that we continue to struggle every day. We struggle. We cannot live up to this standard. We still sin day by day, even as Christians who are being renewed. That's our second point, that we are just beginning in obedience. Let's take a look at what we confess in the catechism concerning our struggle to keep the law. This is the second question and answer of this Lord's Day. Can we, even as true believers, as Christians, people who are converted to God, as it says, can we ever keep God's law perfectly on this earth? And in response, we confess 
a two-pronged answer. There are two parts, and both of them are very important. First, we answer with a flat-out no. Some people teach that you can become perfect to the point of not sinning anymore in this life. But such thinking blatantly contradicts God's word. John, the apostle, says in his first letter, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Scripture teaches that even being converted to God, true Christians cannot live in perfect obedience to God's commands. In fact, we are very, very far from that perfect obedience. In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience. Even the holiest. Think of David. He was called a man after God's own heart. And yet he fell into adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband, Uriah. Think of Moses. Scripture says that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And yet Moses also disobeyed God and struck the rock at Meribah. We all are sinners, even the holiest, except our Lord Jesus Christ. But we must also take note of the second part of this answer. Scripture also teaches us about our very real beginning in obedience by the Spirit's work. It is a beginning. It is a start. We do begin to live according to God's law. We are born again. In Christ, we are a new person who has the Holy Spirit living and working in them. Christ produces that new nature in us. He brings us to a new life. That is what it means to be raised with Christ. Peter says in his first letter that you are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through Christ's resurrection, we too are raised up to a new life. And it is impossible for this new life not to bear fruit. Being born again, we must certainly bear the fruits of faith. That is why we can say that those who are in Christ will most certainly begin to live according to all of God's commandments. And that fruit, those good works, though they are still tainted with sin, yet they become an acceptable thank offering to God because they are offered through Jesus Christ and sanctified by His Spirit. That means that God is pleased with our good works, with our beginning in obedience. Peter says a little later on in the same letter that we as Christians are a holy priesthood. And he says that our work as priests is to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. And he says that those spiritual sacrifices which we offer are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do we realize how amazing this is? That even though we are still sinners today, we are able to offer good works to God which are pleasing to Him because they are done in Jesus Christ. Consider then Paul's words in Romans 7. In his words, we see these two sides, the two sides of this answer, that there's only a small beginning of obedience. There's obedience, but there's also sin still living in us. He speaks about his great struggle to keep God's law. He speaks about these two natures which are at war in him. The old depraved nature and the new spiritual, capital S, spiritual nature. And in this spiritual war, he is brought to his knees. Wretched man that I am, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Paul looks to the day when Christ will deliver him completely from the spiritual warfare and perfect him in an instant for all eternity. As Christians, we have a beginning of perfect obedience. And the word beginning points us in the right direction. Today it is just a beginning, but it is headed for the final day. On the day that Christ returns, he will change our beginning obedience into the perfect and complete obedience which God's law requires. So our obedience is a seed, and one day it will bloom as a beautiful flower. John, the Apostle, tells us in his first letter, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Yes, we will be transformed in an instant, made perfectly obedient to God. Also, our whole heart will be totally aligned to God's will. How awesome to think of this. And the same obedience is started and begun in us today. That brings us to our third point, that we are righteous and renewed in Christ. So we have seen that we still struggle with sin today. We are just beginning in obedience. But Christ will perfect us at the last day. Now that might open the temptation for some of us just to sit back and think we don't need to grow anymore. I believe that's good enough. I don't need to continue to examine my life in the light of God's law. He will perfect me in the end anyways. Those who think this way are not living from faith. True faith leads to a zeal for godliness. God condemns such an attitude. No, as the Catechism says, God has his law preached very strictly. He demands full and wholehearted obedience. And God has a very good purpose in this. A beautiful purpose. Even when he knows that we cannot keep the law perfectly. And what is this good purpose of God in the, the strict preaching of the law? That is what this question and answer asks. If in this life no one can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, why does God have them preached so strictly? And the answer is really a short succinct summary of the whole gospel. Sin, salvation, and service. God's good purpose with the preaching of the law is that it makes us live this out. It shows us our sins so that we will seek forgiveness of, Christ, forgiveness of sins in Christ. And it shows us how much we need to strive to continue to be renewed. God confronts us with his law every Sunday morning so that we will see our sinfulness. The law teaches us that we are dead in and of ourselves. This is what Paul shows us in Romans 7, verse 7, that the law teaches us our sin. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. The law reveals to us the sharp contrast between God's will for us and the reality of our life today. It doesn't just reveal our sins, it reveals our sinful nature. It makes us see more and more clearly the part of us that rebels against God, the part of us that is prone to sin, the part of us that is evil. Why, we might ask, why does God continually confront us with our sinful nature. Beloved, it is so that we will seek 
our lives outside of ourselves so that we will run to Jesus Christ. He is our only Savior. In ourselves, we are dead, bankrupt. We must rest only in Christ. And when we seek forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, then they are forgiven. As Romans 8 verse 1 says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we cannot stop there either. We are righteous in Christ. But Christ also renews us. We are both righteous and renewed in Christ. Sometimes we can be tempted to think along the line that Jesus pays for our sins, but then it's all up to us to live in thankfulness to God for this. But that's not right. We must remember that Christ does not only redeem us from our guilt, but also grants us his spirit who renews us day by day. We are therefore not always stuck in the wretched cries of Romans 7. How can I possibly do it? But we can move on to the joy of Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 3 and 4 says, By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And then listen carefully to this. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That is saying that in Christ, we are able to fulfill the requirement of the law. We are able to begin to do so. In Christ and through His Spirit, we can actually start to live according to all of God's commandments. The Spirit sanctifies us. That's no theoretical abstraction of dogmatics. That is something that must happen in our lives every day. The Spirit uses the law in that process. God gives us the law not only to show us how much we need Christ, but also how much we need to strive to walk holy in a holy manner with Him. He uses it to show us, show us how we are to be renewed, transformed into the image of Christ. And we cannot do this on our own. What we confess here is that while praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop striving to be renewed after God's image until after this life we reach the goal of perfection. We must pray then every day. Pray for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. If there's a certain sin that we're struggling with, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit would help us in that battle. We must pray that He would show us the way of righteousness, the way of love, the way of obedience, that He would work love in our heart for this or that brother or sister, that He would give us a delight to follow God's ways. So we must ask, are we praying for the work of the Spirit? Are we praying that the Spirit would give us a pure heart? A heart that loves God and His ways. God wants our heart. He wants our whole heart. Perfect desires, which we spoke about in the first point. Perfect desires starts with the basis of delighting in God Himself through Jesus Christ. Just think about the grace in the fact that God wants us to delight in Him. God has set His divine heart upon you. He chose you, even while you were still a sinner. God's delight is in you. And now He wants you to delight in Him and in His will for your life. Pray that the Holy Spirit would work that delight in God in you. We must pray that prayer every day. 
Amen. Our song of response comes from Psalm 1, stanzas 1 and 2. Come before the Lord in a prayer of thanksgiving. Father in heaven, we have heard your word and your law. We know that your law is good. It is the best life that we can have. It is perfect and holy. And we have heard that what you command of us in your law is that we serve you and obey you from our hearts, that we not offer mere lip service, but that in our inmost being we have a love and delight to live according to your law. Father, we know that your law is perfect, that following it is the best life that we can possibly have, that the sinful lures of this world are emptiness. But Father, we confess so often our heart is not pure, is not fully devoted to you. So often what we desire is unholy or we have mixed desires. We want to love you and at the same time there is covetousness in our hearts. We covet the things of this world. So often our desires are impure. So, Father, we ask, forgive us our sins, the ones we commit in our hearts, also the ones that no one else ever sees. Forgive us because of Christ's blood poured out for us on the cross. 
the blood of the spotless lamb whose heart was always pure. And Father, we pray, renew us also through Christ. Work in us every day with your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us, purify us, cleanse our hearts, burn away what is evil, and lead us to look to you and trust in you for our spiritual battle against our old sinful nature. We also pray that you would bring to life in us a life in which we delight in you, delight in your goodness, in your grace, in who you are, in all that you have done for us. Father, we pray that you would show us our sinful nature more and more clearly each time we hear your law, that we would seek forgiveness from our sins, work it in us to pray constantly for the work of your Spirit. And Father, do not let us go down defeated in the spiritual battle, but preserve us by your power until that last day when you will sanctify us completely. How we long for that day, Father. That day when we shall be perfect, holy, blameless in Christ because of his work. Walking without sin, but delighting in you. Father, we pray that you would send your Son, Jesus Christ, quickly back to us. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we pray. Amen. We now have the opportunity to give of our offerings to the Lord, to show our thankfulness to him. The offerings are for the work of anchor, and we'll sing following the offering, hymn 72, stanzas 1, 3, 4, and 5.
Receive now the blessing of the Lord and go your way in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.